And let's see. So we're just going to start right into it because there's a lot to do this week like there was a lot to do last week. Tonight we're talking about strings and lists. Now we're talking about lists specifically so we can talk about strings because a string is a form of a list. Um, but that's what we're talking about this week. So why is it important to talk about strings? Um, it's important to talk about strings because Python thinks everything in the world is a string unless you tell it otherwise. So every time you run the input function and you're typing something in, even if you're typing in, you know, 10, the number 1010, Python's going to think it's a string until you do something with it. And because you can do all kinds of things to strings. You can change them, you can search through them, which is important when you're doing things like gathering data or if, um, could everybody mute please? Um, if you're having to do search through strings and change things. Let's say you've got a fixed format file and you're trying to find someone's social security number. All that's going to be done with string manipulation and string searching. So what is a string? Well, a string is an ordered collection of characters. That's all it is. Okay? That an ordered collection of characters surrounded by quotes is, could be a very well, it would be a string in Python if you surrounded it with quotes. It's just an ordered collection of characters. Um, and then it's immutable. What does immutable mean? Immutable means it cannot be changed. And that sounds kind of odd, but that's the way a lot of languages handle strings. They actually don't allow you to change the string itself, but they will allow you to make a copy of the, str of the string. And the language, in this case Python, will make changes to that string as it's making the copy. So a string is immutable, you can't change it, and it's just a bunch of characters in an order. Okay, so this is just a quick what you see in your script. So I have a variable, the variable's called myster. We know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of a single equal sign, I have the words, this is a string. And I put them in quotes. And Python will understand this as this is a string, is in fact a string. So what Python sees is name my stir, value is this is a string. Okay, the name of the variable, and that's the value. Now, I, in this presentation, I represent the string as, you know, letters in these boxes because this is how you have to think about a string when you're dealing with it in most programming languages that I've ever dealt with. So instead of thinking of them as words, you really need to put everything in its individual little box when it comes to dealing with strings in Python. Okay, your quotes have to be balanced. So that means for every quote, every double quote, every single quote, in this case I'm using double quotes, you have to have the same, you have to have one starting double quote and one ending double quote. And if not, uh, Python's going to give you an error. PyCharm will tell you immediately and we will go over what some of those errors are. What is not a string? Okay, so if I say this is a string, you're going to get a syntax error because it's missing a quote. If I say this is a string with a single quote, a double quote to start and a single quote to open, it's a syntax error because that's still not balanced. What I mean by balance is it starts with the same quote that it ends with. And then this is also a syntax error because you have a double quote inside of a string with double quotes. And what Python sees is what it's going to say this is a space double quote and that's going to be the string and it won't won't matter why you put the word string 
after that quote. Now, there are ways to get around that, and we'll deal with that some. Okay, so and I'm going to say this all night long. For every open quote, there has to be a closing quote of the same type. And the reason I put a slide up about this is this is one of those first frustration areas that students go into, and they're like, I don't understand why this is in a string, or I don't understand why I'm getting this error. Most of the time, it's because things aren't balanced. So if you're having problems, if you're getting frustrated with strings, go back, look at this slide, you know, just run through the little bit, the first bit of the YouTube video and remind yourself uh, why, why your string might not be doing what you think it's doing. All right, so I just put up a bunch of errors over there. And this is how to correct them. It's missing a quote, you add a quote. This is a string is double quote. There's a single quote. That single quote is bad. So we change it to a double quote, and it's balanced. So I have an opening double quote. I have a closing double quote, and then I have this other double quote. There are a couple of things we can do, but in this case, what I'm showing you is using the escape sequence to escape it and allow it to be inside the string, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, if a closing quote of the same type is inside a string, you have to escape it. You have to escape it with the backslash. I think that's the backslash. Sorry. I always get confused between backslash and slash and forward slash. I can never remember the difference. Okay, so we just kind of looked at the syntax around strings a little bit. So let's look at the concept of ordered. It's an ordered collection of characters surrounded by quotes, and it cannot be changed. So what does ordered mean? So what you see is Meister, this is a string. What Python sees is that, an ordered collection of characters. Now you'll notice that there are what appear to be empty blocks in that uh, collection of characters. Those empty blocks really aren't empty. A space is a character. So Python has characters that you can't see or non-visible characters. There are a bunch of them. Um, and we're just starting to deal with them. So right now, those empty boxes really do contain a character. It's just a non-visible character. Okay. How does Python keep the order? Python keeps the order by assigning what we call an index value to each and every one of the letters. Now this is important because this is how you're going to do string manipulation later in a lot of different ways. In fact, Python has all kinds of ways to do string manipulation. We only scratch the surface of it in this class. So if I look at my string again, this is a string, I'm underneath that I, we see 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 15. That is how Python keeps the order. It says t is at 0 h is at 1, i is at 2, dot, dot, dot. Um, and one thing to notice, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more because we're going to do a foray into lists in a minute, is that it starts at 0. It doesn't start at 1. Python starts every list, including a string, which is a form of a list, at 0 doesn't start it at 1, which can be confusing for some people, but that's the way it's done. You can't change it. You can't make that 0, 1. Everything starts at 0. And that is a concept that we kind of have to wrap our minds around because when we get to lists, it's going to pop up again. So the way you read this is t is at index 0, h is at index 1, i is at index 2, and so on. Um, and I'm trying to teach 
not just the concepts, but how to form sentences around how what you're reading. I think a lot of people think that writing code is just writing, but you also have to learn to read code. And so in this case, I'm, I'm starting off, off on the path of how do you read the code? Well, this is how you read an index. So every single character in a string has a numerical placeholder. And we call that an index. I'll call it an index through this whole class. OK, so let's talk about lists. Why are we talking about lists? Because you have to understand lists to fully understand strings. But lists are a little bit different because lists aren't just an ordered collection of characters. Lists are, in fact, an ordered collection of anything. Um, and lists are mutable. You're allowed to change a list in place. You don't have to make a copy of it and change it. So that's why we're taking a foray into lists now, so we can get a little bit of an idea of lists and then move back to strings in this lecture. So here's what you see in your script. This is a list, OK? My list is a variable. We know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of a single equal sign, we have an open square bracket. I have the string Lisa, I have the number 42, and I have 3.14, and a closed square bracket. So that's a list. And you'll notice inside that list I have a string, I have an integer, and I have a float. You can put whatever you want inside of a list in Python. It doesn't matter. So what Python sees is my list is I have Lisa at 0, 42 at, at index of 1, and 3.14 at index of 2. Now, you'll notice that a list has comma separating the elements. So Lisa is an element, then a comma. 42 is an element, then a comma. 3.14 is an elephant, sorry, element, not elephant. And then you have your open and closing square brackets, which um, have to be balanced. And it won't matter right now as much about balancing, but when we start talking about lists, and lists within lists, then it's going to become more of an issue. But for right now, you have to open and close that list with square brackets. Um, all lists start with square brackets and end with square brackets. Um, a list can contain an element of any type. Um, just like a string, every single element has a corresponding index. And all the elements are separated by commas. So that's just the formatting. So I'm going about to talk about CRUD. Okay? I know Zybooks doesn't talk about CRUD, but I think it's important. It's an important concept, and we will be using it continually throughout this class. CRUD is create, read, update, and delete. That's, those are the four things you can do to a list or a dictionary or just about anything in Python. So create is, in this case, we're going to make a new list. Read is get to the data within that list. So if, if it's the, you know, maybe it's the index 0 in our previous list would be Lisa. Um, mo update is you're going to modify the elements within the list. And delete, you're going to either remove elements from the list or you're going to delete the list, the whole list. So that's what CRUD means, and we're going to talk about it multiple times in this class. So let's look about um, a little create, read, update, and delete. So to create a list, I just use a close, an open and close square bracket with nothing in between. That's an empty list. Nothing exists in that list. I can create a populated list with elements in between the square brackets. This is still all create. Read is how do I get to it? Now, I get to it 
by using the square bracket syntax and putting the index number in. So what you'll see here is you'll see my list of zero is Lisa. And what I'm just doing here is I'm putting the way to get to the value of Lisa inside a print statement because this is something that you're going to end up having to do. So I say print my list. My list is a variable. We know it's a variable. We can see that uh, under the create. And I'm going to say Python, get me the value that's at the zero index for my list, for the variable my list. And Python's going to go out and it's going to say, okay, what's zero? Is it, that's zero, so Lisa is the value. And then I can print my list of two. And I will get 3.14. So that's how you read or access the information within a list. And this is also going to ha be how you access the information within a string. Okay, update. I'm going to say my list is Lisa042 is at index 1 and 3.14 is at index 2. But I don't want 42 as, as the first index. I want 25. Well, what do I do? Well, it's very simple. You give it the name of the variable. In this case, it's my list. You uh, put an open square bracket, the number of the index you want to change, remembering that one will be the second item in the list, and then you just set it equal to the new value. That's all you have to do. It's an assignment. You just have to understand the syntax for the assignment. And I want to add something to my list. Well, I have something called the append function. And the append function will add something to the end of the list. So I can increase the size of my list by appending. Delete has the ability to remove an element or the whole list. So I can say del, which is a new keyword, D-E-L, and I can say my list of zero. And it will remove that, and then it will re-index everything so that what was the second element now starts at zero, and then one, and then two. So that's what using the del keyword with a list and an index does. Now, if I want to remove something from the list, I can use a remove function. And remove will go in and it will search for any instance of a value. And then it will, it will remove any instances of that value. And then I can use del my list, which deletes the entire list. So del my list at the bottom is different than del my list of zero at the top. Because one deletes an element in the list, the other one deletes the whole list. Okay, so why do we talk about lists? A string is a list, but it can't be modified. Um, so what happens when I want to change a string? Well, we're going to look at that in just a minute. Um, we can, so with a string, we can create a copy and modify it on creation, but we can't change the old string. And CRUD kind of applies. We can create and read a string just like a list. We can delete the entire string. But when we update, we actually have to create a new string. And what Python will do is we're going to call functions that Python gives us. And then Python is going to create the new string in the process. So let's look at a little bit of code right now. And I don't think anybody's had any questions yet. So that is the list one. Let's see. Uh, simple string. OK, this is ooh, strings. OK, we're just going to run this really quick 
So I think that an example sometimes make it makes it easier to understand about how you are dealing with that index value. So I'm going to what's this strings? Strings. Okay. So I'm just going to run through this real quick or debug it because we know I like the debugger. And we're going to see what happens. So I am starting things up in the debugger. I've stopped it at line four. Again, the red dot is a breakpoint. The blue line, sorry, this blue line right here is the line of code that the, comp uh, that the interpreter is on but has not yet executed. So it's executed Meister already, and it's created a variable called Meister. And Meister is, Py, PyCharm tells me it's a string, and it's this is a string. So now if I go to the console and I print 1, sorry, I print index of 0, I get a T. Index of 1 is an H. Index of 2 is an I. Index of 3 is um, an S. And I can do a type conversion, which we learned about last week which is just to do the type conversion. Now, let's do a couple of things here. I'm going to start by just messing up my code some, and I'm going to run it, OK? So here is something that you're going to want, and I can't make this bigger, and I really Oh, I just did. OK, good. So um, I, all I did was remove a quote. And what happened? I have syntax error. EOL while scanning string literal. That's not helpful, is it? It's just not a helpful error message. But computer programmers write computer programming languages, and we're not always the best at, at uh, coming up with a reasonable description of an error. Um, and that, that has to also do with um, how things have to be parsed. But this unhelpful error means sometimes that you have not ended your string correctly. And in this case, it's not ended with a double quote or a single quote. So I can end it with a single quote, and I can run it, and there it is. Now what happens if I end this with a double quote? I'm going to get the same issue. I'm going to run it. And I now have this as a string with a double quote at the end and a single quote at the beginning. And it says EOL while scanning string literal. So this is another error. Now one of the nice things about PyCharm is that it's going to put all these nasty little red squiggly lines when you have a syntax error. As soon as it detects it, it's going to tell you that there is a syntax error. So it makes it a little easier to find. So I'm going to go back oops, and I'm going to fix the program. And now we're going to go back in and keep going. OK, so strings, to create a string, I'm going, I have a variable called my empty stir on the left hand side of a single equal sign. And on the right hand side, I have two quotes with absolutely nothing in between. So this is what's called an empty string. I can create a populated string, which is what we've seen before. This is a string. I can read a string exactly the same way as I could my list. So that'll print a T like we just saw in the, um, in the program. I've got my stir of 10 is S. So read and create. Here's where we get fancy but useful with string manipulation. Let's say I only want a part of a string. I don't want the whole thing. I don't want to, you know, have to go through it and create my own. Well, what do I do? Python has something called slicing that makes this very easier. In fact, it's, it's easier than most languages. And what slicing does is it takes a certain number of characters based on their index values. And it um, makes 
a copy of those and puts them into a new variable. So in this case, I have my stir, which is this is a string. And what I'm asking Python to do by using this special notation is to get the, char the characters at index 10, 11, and 12 and put them into a new string. So this syntax is, oh, it's the variable that contains the full string. In this case, Meister. I have an open left parenthesis. I have the number 10. I have a colon. I have the number 13 and a closing parenthesis. And what this tells Python is starting at index 10 and going through index 12. So don't include the 13. So you're going to go 10, 11, and 12. And get me those characters and put them into my newster. That's all you have to do. And there's a lot of different ways to look at the slicing. Um, and we can go over some of those. Uh, when Just remember, when slicing, the start index is inclusive and the end index is not inclusive. And what that means is it's not going to get character 13. It's only going to go up to character 12. A little more string slicing. So there are some very handy ways to use string slicing. And um, this is a shortcut. This basically says from the 8th, index from index the character at index 8 all the way to the end get me everything so you don't have to worry about figuring out the length or anything like that of the string all you have to do is put that colon there colon there and it will get you starting at index 8 everything to the end of the string now the opposite is to say get me everything from the beginning up to one index before. So I'm going to, if I have colon 4, it will get me 0, 1, 2, and 3. So those are two shorthands for slicing. And they do make life pretty easy. Okay. So I think I have a slicing one here. Uh, let's see. Hold on. Simple string, let's go back here. No. Two point nine point one. Let's see what we've got. Two point nine point one. That doesn't really do any string slicing. Where's ten? No. No, this is splitting into lists which is going to be very interesting. I don't have one on slicing. Simple split. Okay, this is other stuff. So I don't, I apologize for that. I thought I had one that specifically talked to string slicing. I'll have to make one up. I apologize. Okay, so that was a little more string slicing methods. Now, here are some very handy methods. Now, why would I suggest that you use these methods? Well, probably because you're going to need to find it. You're going to need to, sorry, you're going to need to use it in a lab. So, the first uh, function is going to be the find function. Now, how do I use this? Let's talk about the syntax for a minute. Again, this is going to be, I'm going to get a result from this function. So I'm going to have a variable there ready to catch that variable. In this instance, my variable name is index. I have another variable called myster, which we've seen before. So I didn't write the, light, the Python line to create it. Then I'm going to have a dot. That dot says, 
use this function against what the dot what's directly to the left of the dot which has to usually have to be a variable it doesn't always and and so that's called the dot notation and so I will say find lowercase s the first instance of lowercase s in Meister so that's how you read Meister dot find quote s quote so again that's hey Python find me the first instance of the character lower space lower character s from Meister that's what you get from the Meister dot find open parenthesis colon s, quote s quote uh, close parenthesis and in this case it will get you three so if I want to replace a portion of the string I really can't do that but what I can do is I can tell Python hey take um, this one section of the string modify it and give me back a new string so what this line is is my new stir is a variable we know it's a variable because it's on the left hand side of single equal sign we have our our other variable my stir dot replace and then this comma that so what this is saying is hey Python replace the occurrence of THIS with of that string with that THAT on Meister so that's what I'm telling it to do so what Python will do is it will go out and it will create a string new Meister that is an almost exact copy of Meister but that has modified this to that and then count the number of occurrences of a character in a string again this is something you will most likely have to use in a lab and what I am doing is I am saying hey Python count the number of lowercase i's in my stir and give me back a number for the for of lowercase i's in my stir and so that's what Python is going to do it's going to go out it's going to go through my stir it's going to find that there are three i's and it's going to send you back to number three so these are three string methods that you're going to want to keep an eye on when you're going through your labs um, splitting and joining this is very handy because oftentimes what will happen is you will split a string from input and what does split do split creates a list from a string based on a delimiter let's start with delimiter uh, the delimiter can be anything it can be a space it can be a colon it can be a comma um, and in this example it's a comma and the comma is a character so it'll be in double quotes and yes that comma is in double quotes but my little arrow covers that up and I apologize so I have a variable called Meister my we know my is a variable because it's on the left hand side of a single equal sign and by the way that's the last this is the last uh, um, lecture you're going to have to hear me say that all the time but I'm doing it as a form of repetition so that it's it becomes more of just an automatic memory thing um, on the right hand side of a single equal sign is a string and that string has the word first comma space the word second but I don't want that to be a string I want it to be a list so what in the world do I do well I could write a whole big long program that did it however Python does that for me I get something called the split method and split just does that it splits out information data strings based on a delimiter value of comma so what using the split string sorry the split function on my stir 
will get me is a list with the word first at index zero and the word second at index one. And you're going to have to do this all through the rest of the class. You're going to be asked to split strings into lists when you're inputting stuff. So if you're unsure of it, if, if you're in my class, reach out to me. Um, and we'll go through and figure out how to get this so that you can be very proficient in splitting and joining. Because especially on the splitting side, you're going to have to do it all the time in this class. So join. I want to create a string from a list. Well, that's just the opposite of what I did before. I have a list called my list. And I want to join them together and create a string out of it. So what I can do is, now this is a different dot notation. I have an empty, I have an empty string, quote, quote, nothing in the middle, quote, dot join my list. And basically what I have to do is I have to have some string to work off of for join. But I don't necessarily want it to be a string that is real. So this way allows me to just say, OK, don't really have a string. But because I have to tell you to work on a string, I'm going to give you the empty string. And what Python will do is it will do what it does really well. It will say, OK, I'm going to join. I'm going to join all the elements in my list. And I'm going to put that string into a variable called myster. So that's what that does. So let us go out and go back to that little split guy. OK. This one's a little longer, but um, it does go through a lot about string splitting and joining and how that will work. So I'm going to do simple split, simple list, simple split. Does anybody ask? No. OK. Um, so here, I just have my stir first and second. Now, this could be from an input. I didn't go that far in this example. So I'm going to do my favorite thing when it comes to programming. I'm going to debug. And when I step over my stir, if I look at my variables, I have a string called my stir with first comma space Second. I want to turn that into a function, or sorry, into a list. So how do I do that? I'm going to use the split with the comma. So if I step over line four, I now have my list. Can I do that? I don't think I can. No, I can't on that one. I have my list. It has two elements. It has the first element or Zero index is first, and the, at the one index, there's the word second. So now I want to join them. So I go back and I join them. And I have my new stir is first, second. And in this case, yeah, it doesn't have anything. That's OK. So now let's see if I want to do it on like splitting a social security number. I just prints out the new stir. So I have a social security number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and I want to split it. And I want to split it based on a dash. I can do that. And I will have a list called parts. And when I step over it, I will print parts. And you'll know it's a list because if you print a list in Python, it will show you the open and closing square brackets. So even if you're not looking at um, a PyCharm window, if you print it, it should come out looking like that. So now I'm going to join it with the separator. And I don't know why I didn't print out join stir, but we can see here under frames and variables that 
join stories one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's back to the reconstructed social security number. And I can get the length of the parts. So I'm going to say, hey, Python, how many elements are in this list or this collection? And the collection name is parts. So Python is going to come back. And it's going to tell me that I have three elements in parts. So, and that's true. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then I'm going to print the individual parts. So that's just an example of how split and join work. And if anybody has any questions, I didn't say this in the beginning, feel free to put them in the chat and we will open up the mics once I'm done with the lecture. Okay, string formatting. String formatting, we actually saw it a little bit last week, but string formatting is really important. You want to be able to control how your strings look when you output them. And that could be because you want it to read nicely to a human or because you want it in a very specific format for file processing. I mean, when you're talking about like imagery data, they have fixed format files that are not humanly readable but are extremely highly formatted. So you have to understand string formatting. Now we are always going to do this or most of the time going to do this in in the, with the intent of making it more readable for people. So there is something called the format function. The format function works on a string. Um, and there is some very specific syntax. Now this helps um, with code readability and allows for parameterized string for formatting. I'm really sorry that I'm so tongue-tied tonight. So let's take a look at the syntax for a second. First, on the outermost edges of this example is the word print for the print function, just like we used last week. That hasn't changed, with an open parenthesis and a clo closing parenthesis at the very end. Now you're going to see two closing parentheses, but the one for print is all the way at the right-hand side. Then when we look on the middle of this, we have um, a string. And that string has I'm and then some curly brackets and it's and then some curly brackets with stuff in it and then some more curly brackets and then the end quote for the string. Well, what does all that stuff mean? What all that stuff means is every time it's Python sees a curly bracket, it's going to replace that curly bracket with something, the double, the double curly brackets. And that something is going to be the arguments to the format function. Format function will be expected to take as, as many arguments as there are curly brackets in the string that you're using the dot notation on. So format is executed against a string. And in this case, the string is what's in quotes right before it. Um, <clears throat> and this is a sub straight substitution. It will take the value and variable num1, and it will put it where the first curly braces are. And it will take the value um, float1, and it's going to replace it to where the second set of curly brackets are with a little bit of modification. And then we're going to take Meister, the value of Meister, and we're going to throw it in to the third place where those curly brackets are. So this is just a quick example. The number of placeholders has to match the number of arguments in the format function. And so we're going to do our little example here. Number equals 42, pi equals 3.14. So I'm going to have number, float, and meister. Now, one thing to note here 
is that for the float, you have a colon dot to F. What that tells Python is expect a float and only print that float out with two decimal places. Um, yeah, with two decimal places. So that's what that, and there's all kinds of different formatting you can do. But this is going to be a common one for formatting floats in particular. So if, here's my example too. I have my same numbers again. And in this case, I've, I've modified the, the arguments in the format, and that's all I've done. I've changed, put my stir in place of float one, so I swap them. And what this does, this is going to cause a, a, uh, a syntax error. Actually, not a syntax error, a runtime error. Because what's going to happen is Python's going to say, hey, wait a minute. You're telling me that I'm going to do a float with two decimal places. However, you're passing me a string. That's not going to work, and it's going to stop. So let's take a look at 271. Yes. What if you want a word to have quotes around it? I can show you that. Questions for later. How can you bold your outputs? I don't know, but we can look that up. I don't do most of my outputting in Python. I don't write the command line portion of stuff, so I don't. But you can put it in red. You can add bells. You can do all kinds of stuff. Um, what does a debug mode do in PyCharm? I will show you a little bit more about that when we go into this challenge. Um, and for and Kevin, we can go through this in a bit, but um, if you want quotes in a string, there are two ways to do it. You can either use different quotes on the very outside of the string. So let's say you wanted a single quote on the inside of a string. What you would do is use double quotes on the outside or you can escape that quote. Those are the two things you can do, and we can um, do a little bit of an example. So let's do, um, so what does debug mode do in Python? Well, let's go to 271. Okay, so what debug mode does is it lets me see the lines being executed as it's happening and it will show me what changes are happening in the program as I run it. Now what this lets me do is if I have a logic error, um, it lets me walk through the code and see what happens as the data changes and determine where that logic error is. And I know that the stuff we're doing doesn't seem that complex and it's not until you get to um, well next week it's going to start getting more complex and week seven it's going to be really complex and then week eight we go back to not too bad with complex so it lets me see line by line what's happening and how my program is modifying things and is acting as the data changes almost all the programming that I do is data driven which means from somewhere else other than the program, I'm getting data. And I have to do something with that. And that data could be somebody's clicking on a mouse. It could be somebody's typing something in. It could be a dump from a database. So I don't know what that data is going to be. I know what I think it should be. I know what I want it to be. But I don't know what it's going to be. And I certainly don't know what the values are. So I have to understand how to process those values. And more importantly, I have to make sure that when I'm processing, I'm really doing the right thing. So a debugger allows me to see what's going on in my running program, not just what went in and what came out, but what's happening in the middle. And that's why I like debuggers. So if I do 2.71, and if that wasn't enough of an explanation, let me know and we'll talk a little bit more after class 271 okay so I'm going to start by debugging I'm going to stop the other one and run this one 
So here I am, I'm at line one, a red dot means it's a breakpoint, and by the way, you can start and stop breakpoints by just clicking over here. A red dot means it's a breakpoint, no red dot means it's not going to stop there. And that, by the way, is what a breakpoint does. It says, don't care what else is going on, if you reach, if you're in the debugger, and you reach a line of code with a red dot, you stop and you stop before you execute it so the person can see what happens after the execution. So I'm going to input a user word. So we'll use Lisa again. We're going to input a number, which is going to be 42, and we're going to input a float. I don't know. I can't remember after 3.14. Okay, so I've got my three inputs. Whoops, my bad. Okay. All right, there we go. And so now I'm going to output some things. The first thing I'm going to output is I'm going to output user word and user number. So if I step over this, it's going to pr print out Lisa comma 42. And now if I want to print all three of them. I'm just going to do that. And we have Lisa 42 3.14. And you'll notice that even though my value is 3.14189, it only prints out what's after the two decimal places. What? Sorry, what? Two decimal places after the whole number. And then I'm going to uh, break the program. I now have a nice big error. This is what happens when you're trying to pass a string into a format specifier. Colon.2f is a format specifier, and that just says, Python, I want you to do it this way and only this way. And in the format specifier, I will most likely be telling Python what the type is of the value that it should expect. And in this case, it should expect a float because I've told it dot to F, and F stands for float. So what I have here is a big, nasty-looking error that basically says unknown format code F for object of type stir. What this tells me is I tried to pass a string to a format specifier for a float. And in fact, I did because instead of user word or user float, I put user word. Now, it was okay that I put user float for the first one because Python didn't care. I didn't give it a specifier that said, hey, only accept strings. Instead, I said, yeah, accept whatever. The second one is, yeah, accept whatever. The third one is very specific. So you have to remember that that F means float, and if you don't put the right variable type in there or value type in there, you're going to get a big nasty message. By the way, always start at the bottom. When you're reading these error messages, always start at the bottom and move up. What this says is, hey, wait a minute, there's some, there's some problem with the, the type of the information you're giving me. And the next line up says, hey, it's on line 7. So I can go back and look at line 7, and this is one of those times when Python isn't going to point to the wrong place because you'll start seeing that next week is some of the error message you get, Python's not even pointing to the right line because it doesn't know on that line that there was an issue. So this is how you do string formatting, and you're going to have to use that this week. Okay, we're almost to the labs. Oh, we are to the labs. Okay, lab 2.12 is a problem child. The reason that it's a problem child is because we don't teach you how to use if statements properly before we ask you to do this lab. And given that, it's not fair that we don't, um, that we expect you to get, to get this done right if you don't have what we're learning next week, which is branching. So I, uh, in the, the stuff that's uploaded, there is lab 2.12, and it is the solution. 
I would like you to work on that solution as much as you can yourself, but um, I have talked to the school um, and the administration is okay because I explained to them what I was doing and this is the only time I'm ever giving you an answer. But the answer is out there and the answer is out there because we're asking you to do something we haven't really taught you yet. We have an entire module next week on the ability to make an, a decision in Python, but we're asking you to do it now, and that's not fair in my view. So let's go back to lab 2.12. We'll still walk through it. Okay, I'm going to have input, and the input is either going to be first name, middle name, last name, and the output is going to be last name, comma, first initial, dot, middle initial. Or the input is going to be in the form first name, last name, and you're going to output last name, comma, first initial, period. We don't have the, the ability to do the or in between here. Either the first one as its own lab would be fine, or the second one with its own lab would be fine. But the fact that we have to put them in the same lab and make a decision, and we're not teaching how to make decisions until next week, is not what I consider um, a reasonable assignment. So let's go through the flow chart. So I'm going to declare a variable called name. And in that name, I'm either going to put last name, first name, and middle initial. Um, I'm going to clear, declare a name list, and I'm going to split. So I'm going to split what came in from my input statement into a name list with space as a delimiter. This little diamond, this the code that belongs to that little diamond, we don't really talk about until next week. There's a very small blurb of it in Zybooks on week two, and it's not enough. Um, so basically, if the length of the list is greater than two, if that is false, then we're going to put um, name list of zero and then name list of one of zero. And by the way, we also don't teach you about um, uh, how to get to access data from within a list that's within a string. If it's true, then we're going to output the last name, first name, uh, first initial, and then middle initial. So that looks pretty simple, but we haven't taught you about what goes on in that diamond yet, and we will do that next week. Lab 2.13 says write a program whose input is a string and which contains a character and a phrase and whose output indicates the number of times the character appears in the phrase. Well, we kind of know how to do that. We've talked about that as one. There's a count function which will allow you to count the number of characters in a string. So I'm going to declare my stir. I'm going to input my stir. I'm going to declare my list. I'm going to split my list into, split my strings into my list. I'm going to declare care count. I'm going to set care count to the actual character count. And these little bubbles are telling you where you want to look in Zybooks for that information. I'm going to input the number of times the, um, the character is found in the phrase. And that's why we have the split here, because what I am putting in is I'm putting in a character for the first value, and then I am putting in another string. So at that first delimiter, which probably should be a comma or something, and you should probably split on a comma, it's going to read that whole thing in as a string, and then it's going to take that comma out and create a list. So the first element in that list is the character you're going to search for, and the second ele ele element in that list is the string that you're going to search in for that character. Okay, lab 2.14. So there's three parts. Prompt a user to enter two words and a number, storing each into separate variables. Then output those three variables on a single line separated by a space. 
kind of looks like a format a job for the format function to me um, and kind of like the challenge we just did which is 271 because you're going to enter three things and then you're going to print them out and now you're going to do a little string manipulation section two is about splitting and it's about formatting a string based on um, based on the information and actually you don't even have to do any splitting here you just have to kind of concatenate things or better yet use that format function so basically I've got my two words and a number and I want to combine them in a certain way so I want to have the two words separated by an underscore for one of the outputs and then I want to have the number with the first word and the number again as the second password and then I have to output the length which is using the len function against the string um, for each of the two passwords so that one is pretty straightforward it's just input and output and sorry a little process so we're going to declare word one we're going to declare word two and we're going to declare the number we're going to input word one input word two and input the number and then we're going to declare password one and declare password two it is my suggestion when you're doing this program is to create the passwords put them in a string and then use that string again and again so you're not recreating the passwords every time so password one is going to be num word num password two is going to be word underscore word one underscore word two and then I'm going to print out password one I'm going to print out password two and then I'm going to print out the size the length of password one and the length of password two so that's basically 2.4 and this is where you want to find that stuff Zybooks section 2.7 will help you with this yes okay um, that's all for my lecture tonight does anybody have any questions do you want to see any more examples do you have labs you're getting stuck on um, let me know if you do in the next minute or two and we can go over them if not um, have a wonderful evening and by the way nobody has to stay at this point you can all merrily go off with your evening um, so I'm just going to wait a minute or so and see if somebody either opens their mic or put something in the chat and for those of you who were not here last week um, yes I can bring the flowchart back for 2.12 do you have a video on your channel of the basics of pie charm I do not have a, a video on my channel however that's because the people who make Char pie charm have really good videos if you go out there and you look up pie charm you will see videos very good videos from the people who make pie charm about how to use it so that's what I would suggest that you do um, and I'm glad every, everybody found it helpful um, the flow chart back for 2.12 let's do that and by the way if you want to you can just open up your mic Kimberly okay so 2.12 there's the flow chart is that what you needed you just wanted to see it again because this will be up on the video tomorrow on the YouTube channel and also this will be a separate um, link in the description so the way the YouTube channel works is you have this tonight's video but there's also a description and in that description there are links to the um, scripts that all those scripts you saw in the pie charm and stuff 
and there are also links to these individual images. And by the way, next week, because we're starting with um, pseudocode next week, we won't really have the, the uh, flowcharts. We're going to use the pseudocode because the flowcharts become unwieldy. No problem. Does anybody have any other questions? Going once. Uh, can, could we ask a specific question? Yes, you can. We did that last week. Emily, you can uh, um, ask a question. You, if you've got error messages or something that you're seeing, you can copy them into the chat and uh, you can open up your mic and we can talk about them. Hello. Hi, Emily. Hi, so I uh, went to the tutoring for uh, the first lab for this module and um, it looks, what I got so far looks a little different from the answer I think that you displayed. Um, I'm getting only, I think, a few tests. I'm getting like a score of six out of, t so I have like two mistakes. Do you think I could paste the, the code that I have and do you think you could tell me like what I'm missing? Yeah, you know, I started doing that last week and I let people paste their code. So absolutely paste your code and then we'll talk about how to make it better, okay? Okay. Okay, so here's what's going on. There's a couple things going on here. First of all, let me just bring this up because 2.12 is the one that I said I was very unhappy about. And so this is actually the solution. And this is, there's a link to this script in the, in the video. Because what we have is we don't have this ability yet. We don't have these if statements. But the other thing you want to look at is how you're outputting things because you're kind of doing it the hard way. <laughs> so what you've got here is final result equals surname plus and then first name plus and then middle name plus. And that's okay, but it's not as easy to read as something like this. So but that's not really why that you're having a problem. You're having a problem because you don't have these if statements here. Okay. You can't be expected to have these if statements here because we don't really start talking about that until next week. So that is why there will be a link to Lab 2.12 up on the YouTube website. Okay, I will do it that way. Yeah, this is just from a tutor, they were really breaking it down for me, but um, your way makes more sense. The tutor was doing a good job. They were doing what they needed to do, and um, that's perfect. However, they don't, based on, and, and this, is, this is a reasonable answer you could try and expect if you'd only read Zybooks Module 2. Because these if statements, we don't, we spend a whole module next week talking about these if statements. Oh, and by the way, for anybody who's left, I will be on business travel next week. I should be able to hold this lecture. Um, hold on. Uh, I'll get right to that, Kevin. Sorry. I should be able to hold this lecture, but if you're on for about 10 minutes and I don't show up, I apologize and I will put up um, a link to a video for module three that I did last term. So that was just an aside. So let's see what you've got, Kevin. You don't know how many YouTube and Google searches I did to figure out lab one and lab two this week. I'm sure you did a few. Um, I hope that this lecture has helped you. And um, if you look at, at any of the lists 
on my YouTube channel. You will find multiple lectures for week two and multiple lectures for all of the weeks. So if you're really searching and you're trying to figure out the answers, go ahead and take a look at those first. It's always at the end of the class. So if you don't want to sit through the whole thing, you know, you can look over the flow charts as well and you can look over the pseudocode as well because there are links to them in the description. And a suggestion I also have is if you've done a lab and it's not quite right, go back out and look at the flow charts in the pseudocode. They could help you find that one little error. No problem. Everybody have a good night, unless anybody has any questions. Okay, I don't think anybody does. Um, and I should have this up on the site tomorrow sometime around noon.